John Hargrove is a former SeaWorld trainer who came forward to tell the truth about SeaWorld in the groundbreaking documentary, Blackfish. In part one, we talked about how he found his passion for the orcas. In this episode, part two, Hargrove talks about his life after Blackfish and how the future of orcas in captivity may be determined by a mystery stash of orca semen worth millions that Hargrove says exists somewhere. And he should know he collected it. That's next on the PETA Podcast. Welcome to the PETA Podcast. I'm Emil Guillermo, your host for this behind the scenes look at PETA, the largest animal rights organization in the world. On today's episode, part two of our conversation with John Hargrove, the whistleblower who revealed the truth about SeaWorld in the documentary Blackfish. Released in 2013, the movie was the beginning of the downward spiral for SeaWorld, but some say it's not been fast enough. In part one, Hargrove talked about his love for the orcas and the turning point for him to go on camera and speak for the animals. In this episode... He talks about the changes since Blackfish, his disappointment in the recent shareholders' settlement, and the future of orcas in captivity. Hargrove says for the first time in public that he knows a stash of orca semen worth millions of dollars exists somewhere, and that could help replenish SeaWorld in places like China and Russia. But we begin talking about how the movie Blackfish changed his life. My conversation, part two, with John Hargrove, on the PETA podcast. And the movie was such a massive hit, made people understand what was going on. And it had, it changed your life. Describe how that change felt and how it was it cleansing to be able to tell that story in that documentary, knowing that it could have that, the kind of impact that it did. Yes. The simple answer, uh, yes. There was a lot of great things that came from that. There was also a lot of uh, um, negative stuff that came from it also. Um, you know, like, uh, you know, the pro sea world, pro captivity people, they, they would say like, oh, you're, he's just doing it for fame and for money. It's like, okay, well, first of all, people don't understand. You don't get paid. <laughs> we, the, the, those of us who were subjects in the documentary, those of us who were interviewed, um, we're not paid because it'd be unethical because then people can say precisely that you only said that because of a paycheck. So we didn't make money off of Blackfish, the director and the executive producers, those and CNN and Magnolia Pictures. Those are the people who made millions of dollars. Um, But, you know, I I stuck my neck out and knew that SeaWorld would come after me because I knew it was the right thing to do. And I needed to do it for my own soul, for my own moral compass. And those whales deserved it for everything that they had given me. The the, the downside to it too was, you know, SeaWorld came after me with a vengeance, which I knew that they were going to do um, because I was the most experienced killer whale trainer still to this day that's ever spoken out against them. And I had just, I had just quit, you know, seven days before I gave my interview, I, I was, I was a trainer at Shamu stadium. So, um, they they knew they had a problem with trying to discredit me by saying like, oh, he was, you know, they couldn't say he didn't have much experience. Like they couldn't say I didn't have much experience at SeaWorld or that, you know, I, I had been there. It was, but that was 20 years ago. All those things that they were, they could pin on other trainers and they did. And they felt like they could just wipe their hands clean of that. They knew with me they had a problem because they couldn't use those tactics against me. So they had to, they had to try to figure out a different way to try to discredit me, um, and you know, and, and try to s- silence me and shut me up. And you know, I was the only trainer that was legally threatened and um, pursued. They put private investigators on me and just and had smear campaigns and and you name it. But also another thing that happened was that now um, everybody wanted me to 
help them in whatever organization it was. And, and, and that, that was good. Don't get me wrong. Man. Mm-hmm. And I'm, I'm grateful that they did want me to help. And I did help out a lot, but it's impossible to help everybody. So when you have someone saying we're, we're the save the, tur- the, the sea turtle foundation and we're, we're the save the, the seal foundation and this save the elephants and the save the tigers. And, you know, it, it was just, you, you kind of buckle under so much weight. So there's so much expectation from you to like, well, you say that you loved animals and that you're against captivity. Why won't you help us? Why won't you, yeah. you know, and it, so I, I, I was just inundated with, so many um, requests, like not only from media, but from people who wanted me to, you know, speak at their university or school or, um, you know, in a protest or, and it's just impossible to to yeah. take it all on. And if you well, try, it'll just kill you. Well, you became a symbol and, and it was, and, and you were, like I said earlier, you, you became a hero to people who wanted to 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 figure out well what how do we become this voice for the voices how do we how do we do what we need to do and you are the perfect model to come around and yet and yet and I I ask you this because there after after blackfish there was this overwhelming response there was there were there were lawsuits and just recently in february there was a shareholder lawsuit a $65 million settlement by SeaWorld that, you know, that, that, that agreed that yes, SeaWorld downplayed the negative impact of the documentary and that they were essentially kind of not lying, but they were not being truthful. And it resulted in this $65 million settlement. First of all, in the post Blackfish era, are you happy with that settlement? Or do you think that it uh, is there something more they should have gone for? What is your reaction to that settlement about the downplaying of of the things that were revealed after Blackfish? Yeah, well, I I'm very happy that they were forced to pay a sixty five million dollar settlement. I'm I'm disappointed that the figure was not higher because they defrauded um, shareholders out of hundreds of millions of dollars, much more than 65 million. So I feel like actually SeaWorld got off easy in that. And also what I want listeners to know and be aware of is that before the $65 million settlement, um, the SEC popped SeaWorld for securities fraud for this exact thing for, you know, lying, you know, really it's, you know, it's stronger than just downplaying it. They, uh, they outright lied. You know, they said the CEO at the time, Jim Atchison and the vice president of uh, communications, um, Fred Jacobs, they, they knowingly lied repeatedly to the public, the media, and most importantly, the shareholders, which then ultimately led to a more than two year investigation by not only the SEC, the Securities Exchange Commission, but also um, the DOJ, a criminal investigation against SeaWorld. Once the SEC find them, um, SeaWorld, Jim Atchison, former CEO, and Fred Jacobs specifically, find them all um, for a total of a little more than $5 million dollars for securities fraud and insider trading, then the DOJ dropped their criminal case because this this was what it was about. And then that gave the perfect ammo for this, this uh, class action shareholders lawsuit for them to have all the information that they needed to then, you know, overwhelmingly win their case and force SeaWorld. You know, it was, you know, they settled really at the 11th hour because, um, uh, a court date was going to be set within two weeks, and then they, then finally SeaWorld reached the settlement. But you know, I wish that it had gone to trial. And you know, of course, SeaWorld—that's the reason why they settled because SeaWorld couldn't take the chance on all of these things being you know common public knowledge and in in all the headlines. They had to try to 
reduce the uh, <laughs> the damage done by this, and the, and and that's why you know people settle because they don't want all those details to to come out. Yeah, and yet here here we are. Details are coming out. More details about things that went on, and you began it all when you were on Blackfish, but you after that was in 2013 after seven years you must feel are are you frustrated disappointed are you uh, you know because it's slow it's seven years now and sea world is still doing its thing how does that make you feel yeah. i am frustrated by it you know when i first started speaking out i said that the the only thing that i wanted or i i didn't really didn't frame it that way i would say you know what I want them to do is to be forced to stop their breeding program and separation of the mothers from their calves. Well, I was, you know, asked to be the expert witness for the California legislation and we won. It took us two years, um, but we won with a 12 to one vote and then it was signed into law in 2016. And it did force SeaWorld to end their breeding program and forced artificial insemination, forced them to stop separating mothers from their calves, and they could no longer move the whales um, outside of the country, like to China or the Middle East, which they were planning on doing, or or even to other SeaWorld parks, which then creates trauma when those whales are moved around like that. So it did stop all of that, um, you know, and more. And now we're out of the water since, you know, Don was killed. Um, so, but... What frustrates me is that because SeaWorld has lied so much and they continue to lie to this very day and the propaganda that's still out there and there are lawsuits against them that are still open right now and still ongoing um, because about SeaWorld lying to the public and not giving the truthful information about what, you know, what, how these whales really live and what they need and what's really happening at SeaWorld. Um, so there's been seven years of continuous lawsuits and and legislation, and and we've had so many victories. So in in one way I'm happy, but in the other way where I, I am frustrated is that they should be closed down by now. Why are they still yeah. even open? And then the other frustration is is that no matter how much good comes out of this and people are educated and, and um, things have changed and they're, and they've been forced to change by legislation and this and that um, those whales that I loved that I spent my entire career with um, they're still there. They're still in those same concrete pools and chemically treated water living a sterile life. So no matter the victories, the victories are for whales in the future that won't be in captivity. Um, but the, the whales that I loved and that gave me everything and that made, made this even possible for me to speak out and, 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 and do all this work, they're not going to see any benefit from it. And that to me is, I mean, I can't even, I can't even articulate to you how that makes me feel. How heart wrenching, though, is it when you think about the? I mean, we. I asked you to recount uh, your experiences with uh, the artificial insemination. Uh, how do you deal with the? You mentioned guilt earlier. Is it still guilt that you feel? Definitely, I definitely feel guilty that I abandoned those whales. Do I know that I made the right decision by leaving? Yes. I mean, absolutely. Because by leaving, I was able to speak out and I was able to expose this corporation and expose what happens to them, which then allowed for the legislation and, and all of this. And, you know, and then I, you know, but, but the guilt, it, I don't think, listen, if it's still here and still just as strong as it was the day that I left, it's never going to go away. I mean, I have dreams about it that are really nightmares and I, I, it just, that is never going to go away from me. I just, the only thing that comforts me is knowing that I did everything that I could to try to help those whales by exposing the corrupt corporation. You know, like, listen, it's, it's not even just that they exploited, you know, captive killer whales and trainers. It's now been, you know, 
proven in courts that this is an untruthful company that's defrauded even their shareholders. I mean, they're, you know, they're, uh, yeah. they're guilty of securities fraud and insider trading. I mean, this, you know, they, they have no credibility. It's been proven now in the courts. So I, there's so many things that I should be able to latch onto and say, okay, I should be, I should feel happy. I should be happy about this. But yeah. the happiness that I feel about those victories is very fleeting because then I still resort back to that, you know, Takara is still there swimming laps, aimlessly swimming laps or floating motionless at the surface of the pool um, in, in Texas and why I'm, I'm free and I get to live my life. And she's still dealing with, I mean, she's just waiting for her, her time to die in, a, in chemically treated water. I mean, it's just, there's nothing I can do to help her. Do you ever think about maybe a reunion or is that like so out of the question because uh, you and SeaWorld are, I mean, you would be persona non grata at SeaWorld at this point, I would imagine. But do you ever think about that, that about maybe seeing her and the others again? No, I would never want to because having a life with them and being, you know, I swam, I still swam in the water with Takara while she was 16 months pregnant with Sakari. When after she had, and the gestation is 17 to 17 and a half months. Once I was there when, when Takara gave birth to Sakari, uh, when she passed the placenta, Takara passed that placenta to me to pull it out of the pool because it's, it you know, is filled with bacteria and they, they don't want the calf to, to be exposed to it. And, um, and, you know, all those, those things that are just show how intimate that relationship is. When I've had that life with those whales and that intimate and being in the water with them every day, so many years and all these experiences, why would I ever want to be reduced to a spectator in the stands? And really what I would be watching, watching is suffering. And, um, you know, so I, when I, when I left, I had to, in my mind, accept that that was a death. And, you know, I cried like a baby. I've never cried like that um, in my life about anything, um, not even about relatives that have died and passed or, or anything. It was, it was the most um, crippling, em emotionally um, difficult thing for me was when it finally hit that I was gone and I was not coming back. And I accepted that as a death. and. I've never cried again because I, I'd have to just think of those whales as really being dead and gone. So I would never want to just go and, and, and see them and look at them. I can look at old pictures and videos of me with, the, with Takar and the other whales that, that I had relationships with and swam, but swam with. Um, but when, like right after I spoke out and, and people would, want to send me pictures and they were well-intentioned and, you know, I certainly don't fault them, but they would want to send me photos of Takara, um, like, like someone had taken and it was on social media. And I, I had to explain to them, I'm like, please don't send me. I don't want to see anything new about Takara. I don't want to, I don't want to see pictures of her in captivity. Um, and what she's doing, I don't, you know, you got to understand that that hurts me and I don't want to see it. And they understood. And they stopped. Is there anything at this point, after the shareholder suit, the settlement, is there anything at this point, like you said earlier that, well, if, if SeaWorld can withstand all these punches coming its way, it may never shut down. Are you resigned to that idea? Or do you think there's still something that people can do, that listeners, that people who hear your story and understand what's going on? Is there something that can, still can be done? that could end this practice and save Takara? The best thing, because people ask, you know, what, what can I do? You know, I, I don't have your platform. I can't go and do, you know, national, international media or, or, you know, write a book or whatever. I'm like, listen, the best thing that you can do is just not go to the park and tell the people that are in your, your inner life, your, your loved ones, your friends, 
not to go to the park either and why they shouldn't go to the park. And then, you know, that spreads like a virus. And um, look, at, we, we've devastated their um, their revenue stream, their profits. We've dev- devastated their attendance. And for years, there's only so long that they can hang on. I mean, you look at Barnum and, uh, Barnum and Bailey. Um, they, you know, finally went out of business. At one time, they had more money than God. You know, it was a circus that was around for 146 years. And then once enough pressure was put on and they uh, to remove you know, like the cruelty of the elephants, really all the animals, but especially the elephants. And they were forced to finally put those elephants in in sanctuaries. Then their attendance plummeted even more. And they finally folded out of the blue. There wasn't even a warning sign to it. They just made the announcement like, you know, I think they made it in March and May was going to be their last show. And they were what I appreciated about them, though, is that instead of spinning it and and saying some lie, they actually spoke the truth. I was very surprised by it. And I also applauded them for it. They said, look, people don't want to see this anymore. Our consumers did not want to see the elephants in captivity anymore. And they also don't want to see any of these other animals in captivity anymore. And, and we just simply, you know, we, without that attendance, we don't have the money to stay open. And we're going to close. I just thought, wow, how refreshing that someone was actually honest, you know, about what's happening instead of what this, the SeaWorld playbook is to, to lie, 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 spin it, spin it, spin it. And, uh, you know, so. I'm glad they're out of business, but I applauded them for speaking the truth of why they went out of business. And I believe the same will happen with SeaWorld. Um, listen, they they have hemorrhaged billions of dollars. There's only so much longer that they can do that. Do you think it's going to happen in your lifetime, in Takari's lifetime? I don't think that it will happen in Takara's lifetime, unfortunately. I don't think Takara has much longer to live. When you just look at um the the average age of a what a captive killer whale lives um she's already surpassed that so any day she could die um but i definitely it it's going to happen very soon i mean and i and i predict once they no longer have any killer whales left then listen people are not going to go to sea world for roller coasters they're going to go to six flags and other other parks that, you know, that's what they specialize in. And, you know, SeaWorld's desperately trying to move as fast as they can to, um, you know, rides like that because they know that they've lost so much business and they're trying to, you know, mold themselves into a different model. Um, But it's not going to work. Just like the elephants, once the elephants were gone from uh, Barnum and Bailey, um, they folded. And once these killer whales I hate to frame it this way, but have died off and there are no more killer whales at SeaWorld, which I can tell you within 15 years, that will be the case. There will be no more surviving killer whales at SeaWorld. They will all be dead within 15 years. And once that happens, if SeaWorld is still open at that point, but that will be the final nail in the coffin because once the killer whales are gone, no one will come to the park or certainly not enough people to stay open. And, you know, I, 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 I don't want this to be a shameless plug for my book, but I, I, I just look at like, okay, I, I feel like, and I'll continue to do if something, when things come up and they always do, um, everything I can to expose them. So starting with Blackfish and then, uh, you know, I wrote the book about all the highs, the lows and the you know, which really about my career, which really became a tell-all book, even though I didn't set out for it to be a tell-all book. It just became that naturally. Um, but, you know, that book became a New York Times bestseller. Um, China has become a, a big issue because now they captured killer whales from the, from the wild in Russia and sent them to marine parks in China. But China bought my foreign literary rights and they published my book. Um, in January 2019. So I feel like, um, you know, I can't be in China and protest, uh, nor would I think that's safe for anyone to do. But um, it's really amazing that 
my book made it through the censorship division in China. Um, and in fact, the publisher, my publisher for, for China said, this is the first book of its kind to ever pass through censorship and be in, be in our country. So um, that to me is like, okay, I'm, I'm doing my part for China because I, now my, my voice and my, and my word about my career and what really happens to these, these killer whales in captivity, now the Chinese people can read it in their own language. They're not forced to try to read it in English. When I do media or interviews like this, which I'm grateful for because it gives me another platform um, to, to expose them. And because every interview, you hope that there, there's something else, something new that people have never heard before because I've done so many interviews and a lot of them, it's the same information because mm-hmm. that's what, you know, the interviewer wanted. They wanted specific talking points or, or, you know, you give new information, but they edit it out, edited it out either for time or, or, you know, the flow of things. But my, my hope is because there are so many things left that I have tried to say and they have not been said. They have not gotten out All right, so far. I'll, I'll challenge you on that. Give me one okay. thing you haven't said to anyone that you're going to say right now. Oh, uh, there, there's so many. That's why my, the pause <laughs> is because there's so many and I want to use the, the, this uh, opportunity you're giving me to, to, to make it count on a, on a big one. Okay. Here's Take one. your time. Take your time. Okay. Uh, so when we did um, artificial insemination, mm-hmm. obviously I trained it both on the females and the males. Uh, the the males, you're getting a um, you know a semen sample. Obviously, um, we have very very few males even know how to do that. It's a very very difficult behavior to train. And it takes a very, very long time to train it. So um, only a few males in the uh, of all of the SeaWorld killer whales even know it. Um, and of those whales, we have approximately 100 viable semen samples um, that nobody knows where they are. Well, when I say that, let me be clear. So the law that I, where I was the expert for the legislation that passed in California, that law also states that SeaWorld cannot transport genetic material, meaning semen, across the state lines. Because and if people kind of think, well, what does this, what does this mean? What is, what is the significance of that? For example, if they, each one of these whales is worth 25, possibly $30 million. So if you have a viable semen sample and you can artificially inseminate killer whales, no longer in, in the United States, but in China, you can, in Russia, you can, in the Middle East, if they, they don't have them yet, but if they, and I, I know they've wanted them since 2008 at least. So if the Middle East begins to have killer whales in captivity, SeaWorld is the only one that has these viable frozen semen samples. So, and they know how to, to train the whales, you know, to do the procedure. So, if you're looking at roughly a value of $1 billion in, in frozen viable semen that could produce a viable calf. So, when, the, when that law passed and in that language of the law, it says that it is illegal for them to transport genetic material across state lines. The, the fact is, is that there is no oversight, no oversight. So I, I reached out to the assembly member, Richard Bloom, who authored the bill. And I tried to, you know, to get his office to understand, like, look, this is what, because no one else except for me that's speaking out knows about these semen samples. I'm the only trainer speaking out that's ever even done artificial insemination. So, um, and of those of us at Shamu Stadium, um, only only at the very top at Shamu Stadium, or did we know, like when we were doing an artificial insemination, whose semen we were using, which whale's semen we were using. Um, so, 
you know, it was, it was, it was a, a very, a very small select group of trainers at the very top. And then of course, management that knew, you know, which, which whale semen we were using and, you know, where it was coming from, blah, blah, blah. So um, now with this law, um, when they made this law and the language went in there, nobody even knew. And how would they know unless, you know, someone like me tells them that, that we have a, approximately 100 frozen viable semen samples. And they were all kept, either, most of them were kept in California and then a, a few in Florida. Um, so where's the oversight? There is no oversight. And I guarantee you that if, if someone tries to go and look for those semen samples now, SeaWorld will either deny that they have them, um, or, you know, or, or, or say they've been destroyed already or, or whatever. They, they're not going to say, oh yeah, here we have them and, and here they are. My, my guess is that they've already put them in China. That's my guess. Because that would be so easy to transport those semen samples. I mean, you could fit a hundred frozen semen samples in something the size of a, a, a tackle box. So, uh, you know, when, especially when SeaWorld knew that they were about to lose and the language of the law was going to say that, I mean, what was to stop them from just going ahead and getting it out of California before then? Or even after the law was passed, if there's no oversight, they could move those semen samples wherever they wanted. No one's watching them. No one's holding them accountable. And that's never been discussed. So essentially, they're these mystery semen samples somewhere in the world that could repopulate uh, a, a killer whale community somewhere in the, in the world. Absolutely. And it's valued at a billion dollars. So that makes it pretty important. So maybe that's why there, you know, a, a $65 million settlement to shareholders dropping the bucket for these guys. Means nothing. And they already even stated that they were going to use, so they were going to use 40 million from insurance and 20 million in cash. So it's like, okay, so your insurance policy is taking care of the settlement and you're only going to be out 20 million. That 20 million to SeaWorld is absolutely nothing. But also, too, um, SeaWorld is already in China. They, yeah. they, they used to try to hide it when, the, when, when I knew that trainers and vets, SeaWorld veterinarians, were going to China. Initially, they would either refuse to answer the question. Or they would say that that's not true. Then it evolved to, um, yeah, they, you know, they went there, there, um, um, there, there as a uh, j just for help, you know, like just helping to assist them. And then, it, and then it finally came out that they had a contract with the Chinese. So mm -hmm. then it's, you know, it, come on, it, you don't have to be a rocket scientist to see the writing on the wall there. I mean, yeah. if, if these killer whales are now at these theme parks in, in China, they came from killer whales that were captured from the wild off in the waters off, off of Russia. Um, they don't know anything about it. Who does? SeaWorld. So now SeaWorld, their hands are tied in America. So now all of a sudden they just, they go to China. Okay. So we know why they're going there. They're, they're not going to be going there to help them out for free. So they, they have a lot to offer that I'm sure is worth, well, I know is worth a lot of money. And especially if they want to begin a breeding program, which the Chinese have already announced that they, they, they are going to do is begin a breeding program. Then so, so if they've already announced they're going to do a breeding program and then just magically SeaWorld veterinarians and some some SeaWorld trainers that are now in upper management, they just happen to be going to China all the time. Come on, let's put two and two together. Yeah. And then so, no, no, there's been no oversight on these approximately 100 frozen viable semen samples valued at a billion dollars. Give me a break. And no one's talked about this. And you've never revealed no one's, this or talked about it. I've tried. I've tried, but either people like, interviewer couldn't grasp it or didn't un didn't think that it would 
you know, who knows, but I've, I've said it before and it's been edited out. Um, even last year and on my, on, on my hour long primetime CBS interview, I said it and that, and they cut it. But I also know that SeaWorld and Blackstone, who used to own SeaWorld, they both were legally threatening CBS to not even air my interview. And they, they were under, um, put it this way, the top executive producer for the show called it an all-out war. That's how badly SeaWorld was trying to, and they still do, try to silence me anytime I speak out. So, so before even CBS had an opportunity to contact SeaWorld, which, as you know, with ethical journalism, that's what you do. You go to the other party and say, listen, this is what we're doing. This is what's been said. What is your response to that? Before CBS even had an opportunity to do that, SeaWorld found out that they were interviewing me, who knows how, and they, um, they sent their top lawyers to threaten CBS and smeared me in the process and said, you better not air this interview with John Hargrove or we're going to sue you for libel <laughs> to CBS. And, and I will say this, of all the interview, because I shot it over four months, of all the interview footage that I gave CBS, that what aired, which still took number one in the Nielsen TV ratings, but it was, a, it was an incredibly watered down interview. I mean, they left out all the most shocking, um, most horrific and disturbing details. And you might say, oh, okay, well, maybe they, you know, because it couldn't be proven. Look, I have legal documents. I have court records in my possession that, of course, I shared with CBS from the moment we started filming. And these things still got edited out. And I believe, I know for sure, it's because of the pressure that um, SeaWorld and Blackstone, Blackstone's valued at $383 billion, were putting on CBS. So threatening them legally, saying, like, we're, we're going to put you in a protracted legal battle if you air his interview. So what I believe happened is CBS said, look, you know, let's pacify SeaWorld and Blackstone so we don't lose our profit. We want to make profit off of this hour long episode. We don't we don't want to lose money in court. So then they just made it they just aired a very, very watered down interview, leaving out yeah. all the things that would have really pissed off SeaWorld and made them go after them. Imagine for me, here I am once again sticking my neck out. For four months I filmed this and then I'm I'm even told by the executive producer that they they couldn't even use the the, the top executive producer for the show that due to the, the um, legal threats by SeaWorld and Blackstone, they could not, CBS Legal would not allow them to use the title for my, for my interview, the one that they had chosen, because it was too, um, gosh, what was the word that was used? It was too uh, provocative. Mm -hmm. So they had to, they had, so that, that shows you how much pressure they were under that they, that CBS Legal made the top executive producer for the show change the title even of my episode, which was my interview. So then the, the title became this very lame, generic SeaWorld colon, the, the case against captivity. When the whole premise of the interview, because it was for the, the t television series Whistleblower, was about how SeaWorld went after me and tried to silence me from speaking out. So this isn't about SeaWorld. The, everybody already knows about Killer Wells in captivity and, and, and why it's wrong and, and, and all this. This was about, you know, this is the way they pitched it through my attorney. And to me, this was about, look, you're a whistleblower now. All the things that happened to you and what they did to you and tried to do to you to shut you up. That's what this episode is. So then they can't even use the proper title that they wanted. CBS Legal made them use right. SeaWorld, the case against captivity. That shows you how much the, the, the pressure was, the enormity of that legal pressure by SeaWorld and Blackstone against CBS. And really that CBS caved in the end, yeah. they caved. Hey, hey, John, I really appreciate you taking all this time. And uh, I really appreciate you revealing 
uh, some of this about the about the semen samples, and I imagine that they're they can they have a shelf life when they're frozen of maybe exactly. uh, uh, for an unlimited period. So I I'm I'm going to try to follow up on this. I appreciate you sharing it with our audience and with with me, but it it brings us to a final question, and that is. You continue to fight. Blackfish came out 2013. You continue to fight this. And do you ever think that it's going to stop? Or do you ever see the day? I know you said that in 15 years they may be out of it. But if they have these artificial insemination uh, capabilities with the semen samples, it could go on globally somewhere else. What is, what is your hope to, in terms of how this might end someday? For you, in terms of your involvement, I, I do believe ultimately there will be no more killer whales in captivity um, in all countries of the world. Eventually, I I may be already gone. My life may be over at that point because it's right now it's going strong in China, unfortunately. But like I said, I hope that my book helps to at least make some dent in that by exposing people to it. Um, but you know, it's 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 really already over in America and in the United uh, and in and in Europe, um, and you know, it's just that we have these whales that are you know need to live out the rest of their life, unfortunately, in captivity. Um, but there there can be no more killer whales, so we've really won already in the United States and in Europe. Um, China is another story. Uh, Russia is another story and with those being communist countries. But, you know, eventually the novelty, even in those countries, will fade and people will see it for what it is, a, a very barbaric, outdated practice. And um, people will, you know, and, and all countries of the world will evolve past this and go, you know, that's just an outdated practice. Um, but, you know, I, I will, I'm glad. I can I can really be truthful to myself and 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 say that you know I can see the day where there are no more killer whales. I will be alive to see that there are no more killer whales in captivity anymore at SeaWorld um and also in Europe, but China and Russia uh that might take more days and years than I have left in me. But it, it will eventually happen. Yes, it will. It will be all over one day. John Hargroves, thank you very much for um, your time. And thanks for being part of the PETA podcast. Thank you so much. I really enjoyed it. And I support PETA um, for so many great things that they have done uh, all over the world and they continue to do. So I'm, I'm proud and honored to be a part of this. That's part two of my conversation with John Hargrove, the heralded orca trainer who blew the whistle on SeaWorld and who now says that there's a hidden stash of orca semen and he knows he collected it. That's worth millions of dollars and it could determine the fate of future breeding of orcas in China or Russia or wherever SeaWorld wants to breed and showcase orcas. And it's a concern that we all should have, but don't forget, don't forget, the best thing you could do to stop the sea world is just to encourage others not to go and patronize the, uh, the amusement park. That's John Hargrove, our part two of our conversation. If you missed part one, go back and check it out. Part one's where John talks about discovering his passion for the orcas. And that's our program. You can contact us at PETA.org. You can find me on Twitter at Emil Amok. That's uh, E-M-I-L-A-M-O-K. Or on ALDEF, A-A-L-D-E-F.org slash blog. That's where my writings are. Or my personal website, AMOK.com.
Once again, thank you for listening. Check out all our episodes on Apple Podcasts where you can rate and review the show. It helps get the word out about the issues you care about. Our music provided, as always, by Carbon Works. Check them out on YouTube. And join us again next time for more insight into animal rights and the fight for a cruelty-free world on The PETA Podcast. I'm Emil Guillermo. 